Hi there. In this lecture, we see Judith Polgar playing against Pavlina Shlingirova. This is in 1988, the Chess Olympiad women's event, round 10. E4 from Judith Polgar. C5, knight f3, knight c6, and now bishop b5. So the Rosalimo attack, or the Nimzovic Rosalimo, or the Nesmetinov Rosalimo, and I used to call it the anti Sicilian Svechnikov. I wanted to play with black the Sicilian Svechnikov, and you know, it's all avoided. This this would be like the main line, like Svechnikov, that I would like, and this is a bit of a fun killer move, bishop b5. So g6, white castles. Bishop g7 and now c3 and so white just wants to set up a center like in the Royal of Pairs. Black tries to stop that but now white is persistent in any case just disregarding black's attempt to lock the d4 square. We see e takes d4, c takes d4 and this is a fairly unpleasant position to play in fact with the black pieces and I have first hand experience in correspondence style chess with the black side here. Knight takes is played in this game. If c takes, you might think, well, what's the matter with c takes? This extra pawn, it isn't so significant. One key thing is this bishop's not very good at c8. And d6 is kind of a disconnected square within the black position. Because this bishop is now, you know, on this diagonal. And this whole diagonal, but in general, this whole diagonal, but in particular, this square is, is pretty much of interest to white. White can actually target it with bishop f4. This is highly unpleasant if this happens. And I've played the black side with not too much success because now, as example, let's say knight g e7. White can simply be content to lock in the c8 bishop. It's a very possessional sacrifice of a pawn. And black's position is really kind of locked in. So say this position is like minimal counterplay. Say the bishop wants to go on this diagonal. With this bishop on, you know, sitting on d6. Well, it actually has very, very strong attacking prospects here. You can see that with the bishop on d6, f7, this is, this is a bit of a problem. For example, this position is a quick way to gang up on f7. And as example, queen f4, knight e5, and black gets desperate, say d3, and white ignores that, say this position, white's going to end up not winning f7, but playing knight g4 with that pin, and the dark squares are being pierced here, knight f6 being occupied. This bishop on b7 is it's just fairly useless. Uh, so, for example, this situation, you know, black's getting completely crushed, queen e4 threatening mate, the dark squares are being compromised, loss of material, black's just getting crushed. So you can see these nightmare scenarios, they emanate from bishop f4 and d6. And you might think, well, what about a6? Let's look at a6, you know, the bishop could retreat back. Again, the installation is unpleasant, we have a similar scenario where, you know, this is just another variation basically, threatening mate on h7. And this position, we're going to be yeah in a glorious state of affairs for white. This is just an example where black tries to be resourceful. But yeah, white ends up significantly better in these situations. This is just a fictional example. White ends up significantly better. Say knight f6. I mean, because I have first-hand pain of this kind of thing, and I am theoretically interested in the position here on c takes d4 it just doesn't seem to bode well if the bishop goes back here let's look at this then yeah black has been compromised and white's going to be installing maybe a knight on d6 like this and getting the pawn back with advantage and this is black's best play so this situation is very bad for black you, you might have asked, hang on, instead of bishop g4, what about this tactic, knight takes e5? This doesn't bode well, queen takes d4, pinning the knight. So let's you know, look at bishop g4 again, h3. This again is just it's not very good. Here again, knight takes e5 is not good because of knight f5 check. And then queen g3 check. 
with massive advantage for white. So yeah, rook h f8, queen g3. The, you know, white's in the driving seat here, positioning. This is a big position for white to be in. Huge compensation. So yeah, th these things are all all pretty nasty on c takes d4. Yeah, this d6 square, the, the locking and the bishop. The king attack later, the king isn't really that safe because of this c8 bishop issue. It's like the light squares are more vulnerable than usual. We we get all of that from some of the variations. We get the feel of things. I think things are bad. So in fact, here actually, black chose perhaps wisely knight takes d4. Very wisely. So knight takes d4, at least getting rid of white's knight is important here. That could have been an attacking weapon, as we see. So getting rid of the knight. And black again is super wise here. If bishop takes d4, horrible things happen here. Knight c3, this is just one example. The bishop going back, bishop g5. We can see that knight d5 is vicious. So here, knight d5, queen f3. We don't even have to win material. We can actually torture black on the uh, dark squares with ominous uh, stuff going on here. So for example, here, you know, black's in big trouble on the dark squares. And for example, g4 is winning outright because this is end of you know black you know mating so horrible things happen on the dark squares there if knight f6 you might think is that an improvement e5 and then you know what is what is going on here <laughs> you know this is just losing material to f4 there's king f1 here it's horrible so that's losing material so okay so bishop takes d4 really it seems as though it essentially gets a tremendous position why this position because of this diagonal you know this this diagonal here is is absolutely sensitive here so as we see so yes it's it's just all fun and games from, from white's perspective so this is very wise actually c takes d4 now e5 is played 97 black dare not take on e5 you know with the king in the center rookie one and then f4 and then it's just a winning material you know we can even take this first before taking the bishop so knight e7 is played bishop g5 black castles queen takes d4 knight c6 very resourceful so hitting the bishop hitting the queen queen h4 queen b6 knight c3 but here despite all of black's best efforts black now goes significantly wrong after all of that avoiding many of the pitfalls the terrible stuff black goes into another kind of terrible scenario unfortunately Black plays bishop takes e5. And the interesting point here is if white has a central rook, you know, tactics flow from superior positions. And if we break that down here, a central rook does provide combinational support. It is a superiority of a rook compared to the other rooks. And it does provide combinations. Black shouldn't have ignited this e file. Black should have played, it seems, d5. And if white wants to win that pawn with e takes, then here bishop takes c3 is actually winning a piece in a safe manner. There's no rook on e1. So for example, queen h6, f6. This is a safe manner. So you know this is out of the question. And if that's out of the question, e takes because of this little tactic. Say bishop takes c6. Black's out of the woods here, largely. It's only if if it's only a tiny edge if anything here for white so black would have actually seen the light of day there but in the game because the bishop takes e5 we really get a, a great demonstration of Fisher's you know tactics flow from superior position so what elements of the position can you make superior to the opponent the rooks are massive candidates for superiority here compared to the black rooks because they're sitting at home at the moment so we see rook a e1. So this is now a central rook, and it does provide combinational fuel, it seems. So black now plays this combination, you know, to win a piece, but it doesn't work because of the central rook. Black should have actually, before we get into that, black should have played bishop g7. On bishop c4, this position, knight d5, b4, kicking the queen, knight f6, check, 
So if king h8, queen takes h7, but this possession is diabolical. The queen is now threatening queen takes g6 check, among other things. And here now rook h4, rook takes, among other things. You know, this, this is end of game for black. So bishop g7, it really doesn't bode well. This this is such a vicious position. It's funny, yeah, white's just in such a better state. So black goes for this winning winning of a piece. So what could possibly be wrong with this? Queen h6, but now f6 doesn't work. It just simply doesn't work in this position with that difference, that superiority of the rook. It really doesn't work. If f6, guess what white plays here? The rook is really literally involved in the combination or play now. What does white play for 100 points if f6 was played? Bishop takes f6. Because look, the central rook's involved intimately in the combination rook f8 check, queen f8 is checkmate. So queen queen f5 was played. But now, guess what? The central rook is involved here combinationally, in a way. White's play for 200 points. Check all checks, even the outrageous ones. But remember, we've got ingredients. We've got superiority ingredients going on in our favour. So when we're looking for our forcing moves and combinations, superiorities of, of position come into the foreground. Yeah, we have queen takes f8 check. This ends the game. It's a forced check, mate. King takes, bishop h6 check, and rookie h check, and mate. Yeah, this, this shows how dangerous this whole anti Sveshnikov is. And it seems in this course, you know, we're visiting my old friend, the Sicilian Sveshnikov, through actually different sections of the course. You know, the full night's variation section of the course visits Sveshnikov by transposition quite often. Yeah, for, for the iconic games. And here, you know, we're visiting a kind of anti Sveshnikov, which I remember now, all the pain is coming back to me in correspondence style chess. This Bishop B5 is super annoying. My good friend Paul Georgiou also played it against me because he knew it would irritate me psychologically to reduce the tactics of the game and make it more about white just getting a dominating position. If white has superiority in position, the combinations are more likely to favour white, as we see here. So it is remarkable stuff going on with this horrible C3, D4 plan. Even though black's trying to get a kind of, you know, black would really want white to just play like this and let black, you know, play for an attack later, maybe with f5, f4. All of that fun is just killed because white embraces this horrible, horrible pawn sacrifice. I have to say, the pain has come back to me. <laughs> you know, uh, whatever way it happens here, you know, with c takes, this installation on d6 is just a nightmare, positionally. So there are Achilles hills in black's position with the bishop on g7. D6 is an Achilles hill, you could say. It's funny stuff, and the game, despite Black doing all the right things to a large extent, goes wrong, doesn't play D5 here. So a crucial difference of combination. If D5, yeah, this would have been uh, interesting for Black. Black would have had a, a reasonably good game. Oh well. So a brilliant game, nonetheless, by Judith Polgar. Absolutely brilliant, showing the dangers of this whole system quite vividly and through the variations as well that we see, which bring back bad memories for me. <laughs> okay, thanks very much.